Okay, so uh, this is the second part of uh, Lectio Secunda, I guess. Uh, the Felix Cicarona story. So we did, I did part one yesterday. I'm doing part two today. This is a little bit shorter. So um, hopefully we'll knock this out pretty quick. So the title for this little section is the Dies Lustricus. So this is going to be our little culture unit. In the last story, we learned about agnotio. Agnotio is that procedure where a father um, picks up their kid, <laughs> basically, uh, right after they're born. So the probably one of the servants will put the child on the ground, tell the father, baby's here. The father will look at the baby, decide whether or not they're going to accept the baby as their child, and then pick the baby up. And once they pick the baby up, um, that baby is legally their own. But the Dies Lustricus is a celebration that happens uh, a little bit after, a couple days later, and this is the naming day. This is the day uh, when the child is given a name. So before that, they have a really awesome name, or really awesome title, for the child, this nameless child. Um, and depending on the gender of the child, they are referred to as either a pupus or a pupa. So if it's a male child that hasn't received a name yet, it is a pupus. A female child that hasn't received a name, pupa. And those of you know about insects and stuff, this is your uh, pupa, which is that, like, what does it go, larva, and then pupa, I think is the life cycle. I don't know. It's been a while since I was in third grade, but you guys might be a little closer to it. All right, so we pick up here, dienono, dienono, that's the, um, in the ablative case. Anytime we have ablative words like day, week, month, year in the ablative, that kind of feels like ablative of time when, okay? So the dienono would be the ninth day. So we're talking about the ninth day postquam, which I think is technically a conjunction. I think it's a conjunction. Postquam puer in the nominative, and then we have our verb here, uh, natus est, third singular, perfect. It is actually active. Yeah, it's active because the verb means to be born. It's a deponent verb. Uh, solemniter, that's an adverb. Anytime you have the iter on the end, like celeriter or faciliter, um, which is sometimes facile, difficiliter, uh, audacter, those are your adverbs. In marci cicerones aedibus. So this is uh, in, right? In takes the ablative, but m cicerones is in the genitive case. And I think I mentioned this to you guys um, in one of the other stories. Genitives are, as I call them, snugglers. They like to be inside of, for instance, a prep phrase. So in idibus, in the house, Marci Cicerones, in the house of Marcus Tullius Cicero, or Marcus. Dies Lustricus, that's the name of our holiday, Celebratus Est, third singular, uh, perfect passive. That's just a regular verb. Okay. So we have a couple different parts of the sentence. We have the dieno no part, and then we have the main clause. Might be easier to just do the first part first. So dieno no postquam puer natus est on the ninth day postquam after puer natus est after the boy was born. Solemniter, um, I don't want to say solemnly because that's like a, a cop out of a translation. Uh, solemniter, solemniter. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, annual is not really like this. It's, it's got a religious kind of feeling to it. So I don't know if solemnly is really the best. Uh, Celebrate. It's one of those words that's like super, you know, just kind of works on its own. Um, I'm just going to say like customarily, something like that. Um, on the ninth day after the boy was born, uh, the dies lustricus, and I'm not even going to translate that because there's no good way to translate that. Uh, so we're just going to call it the dies lustricus. The dies lustricus was celebrated. 
uh, solemnly, religiously, uh, in accordance with religious practices. It's such a stupid word. Uh, the Deus Lucius was celebrated. Uh, I can't believe I'm just going to write solemnly. I hate that word. Uh, it was... Ugh, skipping it. <laughs> it was celebrated solemnly uh, in Cicero's house. Right. I'm not even spelling solemnly right, am I? Sure. One L in English, because English is weird. It was celebrated in accordance with religious customs. Right. All of these things, all of these celebrations and holidays and things, they were all religious. I mean, holy day, right? Um, so it was an important day, but it wasn't a... Uh, it's not a day on the calendar, per se, because it's obviously dependent on whether or not your family uh, has just had a child. So nine days after the boy was born, they celebrated this, uh, this important event called the Dies Lustricus. We might call it Naming Day, if we had something similar to it. Aodie, so now instead of saying nonno die or die nonno, we have another ablative of time when here. Infantes, love this word. We're going to talk a lot about this word. Now, obviously, infantes in form could be nominative plural or it could be accusative plural. The verb is akipiebant, so it has to have a plural subject. And we have a nomen, which could be nominative or accusative. So a lot of times you're going to get in this situation where two words, one could be nominative, one could be accusative. If you can't really figure it out based on context, just try it both ways. Either infants accepted their name or a name accepted in, in just, you know which one it is. Infantes nomen. Sorry, Ben Mike. Akipiebant. I've been talking too much today. Third plural imperfect active, right? So on that day, on the Dies Lustricus, on that day, infants, which is a fine translation, uh, infants accepted their name, uh, took their name, received their name, maybe. Yeah, I kind of like received. Uh, infants received their name. Infantes. Infans, infantis, is a participle. Fadi, the verb fadi means to speak. Infans or infadi means to not speak. So anything that's described as infans or infantes, these are non-speakers. So if you think about little babies, the first stage that they're in, I believe they're just referred to as infants. Um, they don't really do much. They kind of eat, sleep, and poop. Uh, when they start talking, which is usually around you know nine, ten months, something like that, then they start transitioning to being referred to as you know toddlers or whatever the case may be. Can you tell I don't have a kids? Uh, precaciones fiebant. Precaciones. Precor is to pray. Uh, so so uh, preces or precaciones are prayers. And the verb fio, which is a weird verb. Remember, fio is the uh, passive of facio. So facio means to do or to make. So fio means either they were made or they happened is another way that you can translate um, fio. So precaciones fiebant, uh, prayers were made, prayers were, and again, you can, you can vary it up what you want to say in English. Prayers were what? Prayers were offered, prayers were given, prayers were recited, <clears throat> whatever verb here makes the most sense in English. So I would say prayers were said, right? Prayers aren't really made in English, right? Prayers are said, prayers are delivered. So you want to pick some action verb that works in this situation. And then after this, we get an ut, right? So I know that it's easy to kind of get in the habit of like, what kind of subjunctive? What use of the subjunctive? What kind of clause is it? But just think about it logically. Prayers happen or prayers were delivered, prayers were given. What kind of ut could we have there after prayers? Like, Prayers were said, what's the reason behind a prayer? Why would you give a prayer? Prayers were said so that, right? 
So you could call it a purpose clause. Um, I don't want you guys getting too caught up in the names of these things. I just want you to kind of approach it as um, it's a language, right? So prayers were said so that, ut, right? That's our um, conjunction here. Ut futura omnia elis fausta ascent. So futura, omnia, fausta, they all have to be nominative because my verb is uh, essent. So if my verb is a form of to be, you pretty much only have, you know, nominatives. It's imperfect subjunctive because the prayers happened in the past. So essent is going to get pulled into the past as well. Uh, fausta here so that uh, omnia futura so that all future things would be, Faustus, would be, like, good, essentially, favorable. So the idea here is, uh, they said these prayers so that all future endeavors, right, so that all future events, would be Fausta, would be favorable. And then what are we thinking for that ilis, right? In form, is can be dative or ablative. They want everything to be favorable. This might be one of those situations where a, a dative is in order. They wanted everything uh, to be favorable for them, right? Meaning for the children. So that future events would be favorable, would be, uh, auspicious would would turn out well for them meaning the kids and we have another uh, so we have another reason why prayers were said prayers were said so everything in the future would turn out well but they were also said so that mors morbus ketraquemala so Death, disease, and Ketramala, the rest of the evils, right? Other evils. Ab ilis, ab definitely here taking the um, ablative case. A huerta rentor. So we have a third plural imperfect passive subjunctive this time. A huerto, right? We do have the English word avert might not be the best translation here. This might be a situation where you want to use the very basic meaning of the verb. Huerto, anything that has to do with vert, invert, convert, revert, um, pervert, it all has to do with turning or twisting, right? So the idea is that the prayers are said so that death, disease, and all the rest of the evils would be turned ab ilis, so that death, disease, and all other evils would be turned away from them. So the idea is you want to ward them off, essentially. So we say these prayers, so everything turns out great for them, and so that all of these terrible things are turned away, are uh, avoided, we might say. Okay. So connecting these two lines, going back here, um, precationes fiebant, prayers were said, for what reason, for what purpose, to what end? Prayers were said that, and you could just say that, really. Prayers were said that uh, everything in the future would turn out well for them, and prayers were said so that death and disease and other evils would avoid them, would pass them by. Maribus, and I always have to look up this word because it doesn't look right to me, but maribus and feminis are parallel to each other here. So maribus dies lustricus nonus erat, feminis octavus. So there's a lot of stuff that's been left out here. Basically, dies lustricus nonus erat, maribus, dies lustricus Octavus erat feminis. So the idea here is for boys versus for girls. 
So four boys. Dies lustricus. Nona serat. Third singular. Okay. But for fame minis. Okay. It was the octavus. Okay. So the dies lustricus, which again we can't really translate. Uh, the dies lustricus was the nona, so we have our ordinal numbers. It was the ninth day for boys and the eighth day for girls. What does that mean by day, right? It was the ninth day for boys. It was the eighth day for girls. It was the ninth day of their lives, right? Or the ninth day after their birth. So boys went one more day before they got their names. Girls got it on the eighth day. Boys got their name on their ninth day. Do we remember all of our ordinal numbers? I'll do the Blue's Clues thing. I'll let you scream them to the screen while I take a sip of water, and then we'll see if you got them right. I'm sure you got them right. Primus, secundus, tertius, quartus, quintus, sextus, septimus, octavus, like octaves for our music people, uh, nonus, decimus. And then they get less creative after that. Un decimus, duo decimus, tre decimus, uh, quator decimus, and then they go. Quintus decimus, sextus decimus, uh, septimus decimus, octavus decimus. They get really, actually, no, for 18th, I think they'll do duo de weekensimus or something crazy like that. As long as you know one through 10, you're good to go. Okay, so nonus would be the ninth day, octavus would be the eighth day. And last but not least, parvo kikeroni, prinomen inditum est. Marcus, nam apud Romanos, primogenito filio, patris praenomen impone batur. Ooh, let's take that piece by piece. Parvo Ciceroni. Parvo could be dative or ablative, but Ciceroni is definitely dative. Okay, so when you have noun adjective pairs like that, sometimes there's only one possible combination uh, where they both work. And for this sentence, it would be dative. Prinomen inditum est, that's my verb, inditum est, perfect passive, fourth principal part, let's go, scoot this over, nominative, okay. So the prinomen Marcus, and again, prinomen is not a good word, I mean, you could translate it as first name, but uh, just call it the prinomen, right? Some, some words just don't need to be translated. Um, the prinomen, Marcus, inditum est parvo ciceroni. Inditum is a compound verb. It's in plus do. Do dare means to give. So literally the prinomen was given onto him, which we don't really say in English. So you could just say it was given to him. Uh, the prinomen Marcus was given to him. He's in the dative case because it's a compound verb. And a lot of times compound verbs will take uh, a dative instead of an accusative direct object. It was given unto him. The prinomen Marcus was given to him. Why was the prinomen given to him? Nom. I love this little word nom. It means cuz in the sense of because why was it given to him? Because apud Romanos, so apud is a preposition. Apud is very similar to uh, inter. It kind of has the same meaning uh, as inter, because or because. Inter Romanos, apud Romanos, because uh, among the Romans, right? Primo genito filio. We know what a filio is. Primo genito. Primo, ordinal number. 
primos first. Genitus means uh, born. So the primogenito filio would be the firstborn son. Okay. Imponebatur prinomen patris. So I'm thinking we got another dative here, just like parvo kikaroni. The primogenito filio. Patris is, of course, uh, in the genitive case. Prinomen is my subject. And then we have a passive verb here, imponebatur. So among the Romans, apud Romanos is kind of like saying mos erat. It was the custom, apud Romanos. Uh, because among the Romans, the prinomen patris, the father's prinomen, Father's prinomen, imponebatur, literally was put on, was placed on, was given to, was given to the primo genito filio, was given to the first born son. So this being uh, Cicero's first son, his son would be given the name Marcus Tullius Cicero. Marcus being the prinomen, Tullius being the family name, and Cicero being the branch of the family because there were a lot of Tullii um, out and about. So if you wanted to specify exactly which, you know, it's like, oh, you're, you're Uncle Cicero's kids, right? You're in that part of the family kind of thing. They, those would be the different branches of the family. So now he's nine days old. He's been given his father's name, and now he's officially, uh, you know, considered a member of the family. He's been accepted through Agnotio, and he's been given his name on his Dies Lustricus, on his naming day. Okay, I'm going to cut it there because it's a shorter section of the text, um, and I'll be back tomorrow for relative clauses. All right, guys, see you then.